Hi everyone. Um, it's been a long time, but uh, I just I felt like I needed to do a brief video response to uh, a YouTuber called Bree, who shared uh, in a video a few months ago uh, her experiences with sexual assault and uh, some commentary, um, feministic commentary on uh, on the experiences of women in the culture and uh, I left uh, this comment I'm probably not going to read it completely verbatim but um, but I think that it deserves an entire video um, basically her contention is that uh, that yes she acknowledges that men have problems but that those problems that men have uh, men suffer nowhere near as much as women do and therefore uh, something I don't know um, so I just wanted to uh, I'm gonna leave the link to her video in the low bar and I'm gonna thank uh, Bass Fizz or Bass Fizz or otherwise known as Xerxes um, for bringing this particular video to my attention uh, he did a, a couple of really good responses to it and um, I would suggest that you go and watch those and I will leave links to those in the low bar as well but um, here is my commentary on her conclusions as to uh, her experiences of sexual assault and the wider world. And uh, so, yeah, here goes. Okay, I'm not going to comment on your sexual assaults other than, than to say that I have sexual assault in my own history. And so I hope you can appreciate my perspective a little bit. You claim that none of your male friends feel afraid walking down the street. There are a few reasons this might be the case that have nothing to do with male privilege or the relative levels of actual liability regarding physical assault. The reality is that men are about three quarters of the victims of violent crime on the street, stranger violence, including muggings, robbery, beatings, and homicide, and about half the victims of intimate partner assault. It's been increasingly revealed as well that they are no strangers to sexual violence. A recent study found that 43% of college-age men reported having been subjected to unwanted or coercive sexual experiences. About half of that 43% said the unwanted experience was sexual intercourse, and 95% of them said the perpetrator was a female acquaintance. In any given situation, Men are at equal or higher risk of assault, and yet they consistently report less apprehension around physical violence. In fact, studies have shown that even after they have been victimized by violence, men are less fearful of violence than even women who have never been victimized at all. So I'm going to present a couple of, you know, a few hypotheses as to why this might be the case. Number one, testosterone. While the alleged causal link between testosterone and aggression has been significantly discredited, that is, there is no repeatable indication that high testosterone levels cause aggression and a growing body of evidence to indicate instead that aggression increases testosterone production, testosterone has been linked to decreases in risk aversion and increases in body confidence in both men and women. One aspect of this might be found in one of the largest sex differences in personality, which applies to the emotional response to a perceived threat. Apprehension, which is much higher in women, and vigilance, which is much higher in men. Apprehension could be described as fear for one's safety and well-being, while vigilance might be described as emergency preparedness. The difference between these two emotions is that only one implies that the experiencer has a sense that they're capable of handling said potential threats. As I said, apprehension is just fear. Vigilance is being aware, but ready. And the but ready part might have a lot to do with testosterone. Hypothesis number two. No one really cares about threats and harms that f befall men. The messages from society, including feminism and including you, Brie, if you think about it, is that any threat or harm that might befall a man is really nothing compared to what might befall a woman. To paraphrase you yourself, men can be assumed to be safer than women simply because men don't feel as imperiled as women do. 
Given the statistics on violence, this is an erroneous assumption on the part of both men and wider society. It's particularly erroneous given that women are in fact the demographic in society that is least likely to be victimized by violence in general. And yes, that includes children. Men are raised in a society that is not concerned for their safety or the harms that befall them. Therefore, it is not a stretch to speculate that perhaps men internalize this lack of concern. Society prioritizes harms and threats to women, so men assume erroneously that they are at a lesser risk, despite ample statistical evidence that they are at a greater risk overall. Hypothesis 3. Even among children, boys are more likely to be victimized by physical violence, whether it's rough-and-tumble play that goes too far, physical bullying, or physical abuse from parents and caregivers. Mothers actually hit their sons two to three times as often as they hit their daughters on average. While more girls are sexually abused than boys, more boys than girls suffer the most severe forms of sexual abuse, uh, that's forced rape or intercourse. And as such, boys are more likely to be raised with violence as a normal part of their lives. Violence is more likely to be normalized in a boy's experience than in a girl's. Therefore, boys have been acclimatized to the reality of being hit and the understanding that they're not made of spun glass. Being hit is not a terrorizing bogeyman to a seven-year-old boy. It's just a part of their regular life. Girls are much more likely to grow up never having had such experiences of violence by peers or caregivers, and having never experienced it, maybe they fear it all the more. Hypothesis 4. Rub a little dirt in it. Boys are expected to man up, walk it off, and play through the pain. They're expected to distract themselves from their own suffering and not bother others with it. In adulthood, these attitudes are amplified, even by the feminists you claim advocate that men should be allowed to cry or to express their pain. I can't count the number of feminists who claim that MRAs, the people trying to draw attention to the problems unique to men and boys, are piss babies, man babies, whiners, coffee mugs with I bathe in male tears on them, you know, all of this stuff, beard tears, I'm sorry I hurt your man feels, all of those things to minimize the feelings of men and boys when those men and boys dare to express them. Or worse, men trying to draw, to draw attention to the suffering of men and boys are often cast as privileged misogynistic oppressors determined to harm women. When the mere act of expressing your distress and pain is so easily portrayed in the culture as you being a baby or a loser or a misogynist who's out to hurt women. And when these attitudes are embraced by the dominant ideology dealing with gender, it's no surprise that men will go out of their way to protect themselves psychologically. If there's no way to express one's pain and fear without that pain and fear being minimized or used to vilify them, then the easiest path to any sort of inner peace and inner consistency is to just suppress that pain and fear. If expressing it only leads to punishment, then you just don't express it. And if you can't express it, then it's best to convince yourself that you're not even feeling it in the first place, to just rationalize it away. Feminists are as guilty, at least, as any other segment of the culture for placing men in this double bind. And in my opinion, they are the worst offenders. I mean, traditionalists tell men, man up, because nobody gives a shit about you. Feminists tell men, we do care, but then when men actually speak to their experience, feminists cause them, accuse them of mansplaining or misogyny or derailing or sea lining or being crybabies or man babies shedding beard tears or being rape apologists or any number of the other misogynistic or emasculating offenses that essentially demolish a given man's social identity, his credibility within society as a man. Now, it's my belief that the fear you, Brie, claim to feel that men don't claim to feel is due to a combination of all of these factors. Which brings me to conclude that you, Brie, are part of your own problem. You minimize men's suffering and you remain stolidly focused on your own. You claim that women suffer more than men because they feel more fear walking down the street when in reality men have much more cause to be fearful than you do. And I'm almost positive that as a feminist, you're 
solution to the problem of your own fear, which is your own responsibility, is to start teaching boys not to rape and start teaching boys to respect women, which is in and of itself an assault on the psyches of children just because they happen to be male all while being entirely ignorant of the studies I mentioned above regarding college-aged men's experiences of being coerced into sex by women and girls. And you have bought into an ideology that tells you all of your greater feelings of vulnerability are entirely based in reality, rather than one which takes an objective look at what, what's actually going on out there in the real world. If men are in more danger than you, I mean, if children are in more danger than you, why are you more afraid than either men or children? Could it be in part or in whole because you have psychologically invested in an ideology that tells you you need to be afraid, that you are in more objective danger, that you should not empower yourself by learning some form of self-defense or learning to carry yourself more confidently or learning how to you know, put your own fucking foot down because society should do it for you instead. Tell me, how empowered are you as a woman going to be if you buy into an ideology that says you shouldn't empower yourself, society should instead teach five-year-old boys not to rape? How independent are you as a woman if it's society's job and not your own to keep you safe? You're your own problem, Brie. I can't stress this enough. In each of the stories you told, you cast yourself as a passive object being acted upon by a man. You took no effective action on your own to deal with any of it. You took no adult responsibility in the moment for your own safety. And I'm not telling you this to be harsh or dismissive. Again, I've been a victim of sexual violence myself. But the feminist paradigm has managed to convince you that learned helplessness is the way to go. It's taught you that there's Nothing you should have to do to ensure your own safety and well-being. Therefore, there's nothing you can be expected to do. It's the opposite of the message that's taught to boys right from the get-go. And then you use the emotional and psychological calluses that men have been forced to form, to grow, in order to cope with their reality as evidence that women have it worse, when objectively women have it better even than children when it comes to experiencing violence. You have a very great deal to be grateful for, and yet you focus on all the negatives, not just for yourself, but for all women. Well, I'm a woman, and I've been a victim of sexual and physical violence, and as a mother of two sons and a daughter, I know what I and my daughter have to be grateful for, that if and when we are harmed, it will be taken seriously, that we will not be expected to cope with it on our own, to suck it up and walk it off. And I know as well the messages my sons are receiving from this culture. No one cares about your pain. No one cares about your suffering. Stop being a piss baby misogynist shit lord. And also, don't rape, because unlike normal humans, you need to be taught not to rape. Oh, and boy, the, by the way, boys are stupid. Throw rocks at them. And also, what have you done for women lately? I have no idea whether you'll read my comment or watch this video. I hope you do and I hope it will make you think. But frankly, I, I, I just, I have no optimism regarding that. Um, you seem to have completely bought into the paradigm that in any given situation, women are gonna have it worse. And, and that's just so not the case. Think about all of our responses to violence, particularly sexual violence. Right? All of society's attention is on women. Right, Men are as likely or more likely to experience every single form of violence, of severe violence. And yet none of society's attention is on those male victims. In fact, when male victims speak up, they're accused of, of whining or malfeasance. Right? They're expected to cope with it on their own. And if you think that society's attention and society's acknowledgement that women can be victims is an indication that women have it for have it worse, right? I just I just don't know how else to convince you.
men actually in nearly every aspect of in nearly every way that we would measure uh, and every metric that we would use to say that blacks are oppressed compared to whites. Men fare worse compared to women. Access to housing, access to health care, funding for social programs, um, homelessness, uh, rates of violent victimization, uh, rates of, of homicide, rates of workplace deaths, um, rates of incarceration, all of those things we would look at if they were happening to blacks more than whites, and they do happen to blacks more than whites, we would use those to prove that blacks are in a, a disadvantaged position compared to whites. Yet we look at those metrics of men compared to women, and we somehow don't conclude that men are at a disadvantage compared to women. And uh, part of that is because women like you, uh, women like most feminists, are all about your feelings. Your feelings. You feel more in danger, therefore you are. You feel more vulnerable, therefore you are. You feel more harmed, therefore you are. And that's just not the case. And... Uh, I hope that uh, my comment and this video reiteration of my comment helps you to maybe put some things in perspective. Um, I think the worst possible thing for somebody who's gone through a sexual assault is to feel absolutely no sense of agency through that assault. And that seems to be what you felt all three times that you were helpless that there was nothing you could do there was there was no action you could take to make that stop or to to I guess reject that guy who uh, who masturbated and exposed himself in front of you um, that you felt that there was nothing you could do that doesn't mean that there was nothing you could do it just meant that that was what you felt and uh, the entire paradigm of feminism that you should not be expected to take some action um, in order to mitigate those situations. That's a disempowering paradigm. It's not an empowering one. Relying on society to protect you is not empowering to you as an individual. Relying on society to put its foot down on your behalf is not empowering to you as an individual. You know, what is empowering is expectations. The expectation that you will be self-determining and the expectation that you will look after yourself and take an interest in your own safety and well-being. And that's what we teach boys. And that's what boys learn because nobody gives a shit about them. Nobody gives a shit about them unless they're willing to do that. And I don't know how anybody is going to be able to solve this issue with women and them feeling imperiled even when they're not if all we do is tell women you shouldn't be expected to say no. You shouldn't be expected to put your foot down and say not I'm busy or not I have a boyfriend, but dude, I'm not interested. Thanks, goodbye. Um, I, I don't know how we can empower women if women are not willing to embrace their own empowerment by exercising their right, their absolute right to say no when even a sexual partner does something to them that they find degrading. Um, It's not society's responsibility to empower you. It's not. Particularly when you have no interest in exercising that power whatsoever. So, I just, I hope that this makes you think. I hope that this makes you reconsider the things that you've been told. And, uh... And I hope that 
maybe informing you that you had agency to act. You had the agency to act in all three of those situations that you talked about. You had absolutely the ability to act on your own behalf in every single one of those situations and chose not to. Agency is what helps mitigate feelings of helplessness. If you feel that you have some control over your situation, you feel less helpless. You feel less like an object and more like a person with individual power. And somehow you've been convinced that even though you have this power, you don't. Or if you know you have the power, you have no right to exercise it. And that is not a healthy message. And as a feminist, uh, that's all the, that's the only message you're going to receive from the ideology you subscribe to. So hopefully, um, you'll watch this video or read my comment and, uh, well, as much as I feel for you regarding your experiences, I, uh, I hope that you'll take what I've said into consideration and maybe use it in order to become more empowered as an individual within yourself. So I guess that's it. That's all I have to say. And uh, sorry it's been so long, everybody else. Uh, but, uh, you know, duty calls. I'll be showing you a picture of my bathroom fairly soon. And uh, I'm sure you'll all be absolutely horrified by what I've uncovered. So um, <clears throat> but, uh, and there will be another video, uh, up within the next week or so regarding, um, Milo Yiannopoulos' beautiful, uh, it, it appearance on the big questions. And, uh, I'll be, uh, deconstructing that entire debate in detail. So, um, anyhow, that's it for me. And, uh, I'll see you guys later.